Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ajax Public Library's Brain Health Program presented by the Alzheimer's Society of Durham Region. I'm Julia Campbell, and I'm the Adult Services Librarian at the Ajax Public Library. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. <coughs> I just wanted to start with a couple of housekeeping items. Um, as I mentioned, this, after, this morning's program is being recorded, so I would ask that you please keep yourself muted um, just so that you are not heard in the recording and to minimize any distractions. We have quite a large group joining us today. Um, and of course, the chat button is there along the bottom if you have any questions or comments you would like to share. Um, please feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation and our presenter Ashley will either get to them during the presentation or at the end. Um, and just to test out the chat, if you would like to share where you're logging on from today in the chat, I would love to see where everyone is tuning in from for today's program. I am myself, I'm at the Ajax Public Library main branch on Harwood. Um, we do have closed captioning of our program today. Um, so if you would like to turn on the captions, you can do so by clicking live transcript at the bottom of the Zoom screen and then show subtitles. And if you experience any technical difficulties, I recommend that you exit the Zoom and re-enter. And if you continue to have difficulties, please place a comment in the chat and I will do my best to assist you. Looks like most people are tuning in from Ajax this morning. Oh, and one from Philadelphia, wow. <laughs> uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter, Ashley Farrakioli, a community education coordinator with the Alzheimer's Society of Durham Region. Um, she recently started this position after working in long-term care for 13 years, and she is a graduate from York University with a Bachelor of Arts Honors degree in Sociology. Um, she's completed a post-grad program at Georgian College for Recreation and Gerontology, and she most recently began her Master's in Counseling Psychology. She has a passion for working with people and helping people live their best lives, and when she's not working or studying, she enjoys spending time with her two daughters, husband, and eighth-month-old Golden Retriever. And we are lucky to have her with us today. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Ashley to begin her presentation. Welcome, Ashley. Thanks so much, Julia, for that great introduction. And thank you to everyone for joining us today. Today, we're gonna to learn a little bit about what dementia is, but the majority of our time is gonna be spent talking about ways to reduce our risk for developing dementia by creating some healthy habits for our brains. So to start, I just thought I'd give you a few fun facts about our brains to really highlight the important role that it plays. So 60% of our brain is made up of fat and our brain isn't fully formed until the age of 25. Our brain's storage capacity is considered virtually unlimited. Our brain information travels up to an impressive 268 miles per hour. Just think for a sec how fast that is. The spinal cord is our main source of communication between the body and the brain. And it's actually a myth that we only use 10% of our brains. We actually use all of it, even when we're sleeping. Uh, and neurologists have confirmed that our brains are always active. And our brain weighs up to about three pounds as an adult. And a piece of brain tissue the size of a grain of sand contains 100,000 neurons and 1 billion synapses. And finally, the human brain can generate about 23 watts of power, which is enough to light a light bulb. So you can see that our brain has a big job to do, so it's important that we take care of it. So one of the ways that our brains can become affected is due to dementia. And dementia is an umbrella term for any disease that causes changes in the brain that get worse over time. So these changes can include things like memory loss or problems with language, trouble with familiar tasks and more. And dementia is diagnosed when these changes start to affect the person's everyday activities. And there are many diseases that can cause changes in the brain. Um, and these are known as neurodegenerative diseases. And there's estimated to be over 90 different types of dementia with the four most common being what you see on the screen here. So Alzheimer's disease, which accounts for about 60 to 80% of all cases. Vascular dementia, which accounts for about 20%. Lewy body dementia, which is about five to 15% of cases. And frontotemporal dementia, which is about two to 5%. 
And what's common amongst all these forms of dementia is that there is no cure. It's progressive, meaning it's gonna get worse over time and that they are all unfortunately fatal. The good news is we can reduce our risk of getting dementia by up to 40% by simply focusing on our brain health. So if you'd like to learn more information about the specific types of dementia, I encourage you to check out our website, which has lots of great resources. And I'll also post my contact information at the end. And I'm happy to help you uh, find the information that you're looking for, point you in the right direction, or let you know of any upcoming education sessions that we have. So right now in Canada, there are over half a million people currently living with dementia. And approximately 76,000 people are diagnosed each year. So it's estimated that by the year 2030, there will be close to a million people living with dementia. That's only eight years away. And in Durham region alone, there is estimated to be 11,843 people currently living with dementia. One in five of us will experience being a care partner for a person living with dementia. So that may be supporting a family member or a neighbor or a friend. Um, but whether we're a care partner or not, it's estimated that four out of five people are affected by dementia in one way or another. And it's important to note that dementia doesn't just happen to older people. While age is still the biggest risk factor for dementia, people in their 50s and 40s and even in their 20s and 30s can also develop dementia. And we call this young onset dementia, and it accounts for an estimated two to 8% of all dementia cases. And right now in Canada, there are at least 28,000 Canadians under the age of 65 who are living with young onset dementia. Only about 25% of cases are formally diagnosed. So undiagnosed dementia can put the person at risk. They become at risk of getting lost or having a car accident if they're still driving or making a medication error or having financial difficulties. Early diagnosis is an opportunity to get treatment and to participate in the planning of your future and live well for as long as possible and to maintain your dignity. And as I mentioned, there is no cure, but there are some medications that can reduce some of the symptoms. So the earlier th those are treated, the better the quality that person will have. And also, like I mentioned, the number of people living with dementia is going to continue to increase over the next few years. So it's really important for us to understand what dementia is, what it looks like, and how we can reduce our risk. So typically there are 10 warning signs, uh, and it's important to note that a person may not experience all of these, uh, and they're not going to happen in this order. Um, and it's also important to recognize that each type of dementia is unique, or each case of dementia is unique. And we often say, if you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. And that's because everybody experiences the disease differently. So our first warning sign, and I'm sorry that the font is so small, uh, is memory loss that affects day-to-day -day abilities. So that's forgetting things often or struggling to retain any new information. Uh, the person may ask the same questions multiple times, and that's because their brain can no longer hold on to that new information. Our next one is difficulty per performing familiar tasks. And that's forgetting how to do something you've always done your whole life, such as preparing a meal or getting dressed. Problems with language is the next one. And that's forgetting simple words or substituting words that don't fit in the context. So the person may say, where's my cold? But what they actually mean is where's my sweater because they're cold. Our first one here is disorientation in time and place. Uh, and that's not maybe not knowing what day of the week it is or getting lost in a familiar place. Um, maybe the person is still talking about their parents as if they're still alive. And that's because the person in that moment, they're living in a different time. Or maybe they've walked the same route in the neighborhood for years and years, but now they're getting lost. Impaired judgment is also a warning sign. And that's not recognizing that maybe a medical problem needs attention, or maybe they're wearing light clothing on a cold day. Problems with abstract thinking can happen as well. So that's having difficulty balancing a checkbook 
or not understanding what numbers mean and how they're used. The person may start to misplace things in unusual places. And this can happen to any of us. I've you know, been known to do this myself. I put something in the fridge that doesn't belong. But when these things start to happen more often, uh, that's when it's more of a cause for concern. Um, so we often give the example of putting a wristwatch in a sugar bowl and then putting it in the cupboard. Um, we also see changes in mood and behavior as a warning sign. And this can be people exhibiting severe mood swings from being easygoing to quick tempered. And one minute they're laughing and the next minute they're crying or they're angry for no apparent reason. We also see changes in personality. So that's acting out of character um, or they're confused or suspicious. Sometimes this one goes along with misplacing things. If a person um, forgets that they put their wallet somewhere, they may become suspicious of someone and think that people are stealing from them. And our last one is loss of initiative. So that's loss of interest in friends or family or things that they used to love doing. So if you or someone you know are experiencing any of these symptoms, I encourage you to speak to your healthcare provider as soon as possible. So our brain is one of our most vital organs and it plays a role in every action and every thought that we do. We use our brains in everything we do each and every day. We use it to eat, to breathe, to get dressed, to walk, and so much more. So when we compare the brains of two individuals like you see on your screen here, um, one of them has Alzheimer's and the other one does not. Um, but both brains are from people who live to be the same age, are the same height and weight, and are the same gender, but we can notice some uh, significant differences between those two brains. So the brain of an Alzheimer's patient on the right is considerably smaller than the brain on the left, which is that of a healthy individual. In fact, the brain shrinks down to as little as one third of its normal size as the disease progresses. And also when we look at a healthy brain on the left, we can see that the folds of the brain are very full and they're closely packed together. In contrast, when we look at the brain ravished by Alzheimer's disease, we can see that the folds are much more narrow and um, the gaps between them are significantly wider. So risk factors are aspects of lifestyle, environment, and genetics uh, that contribute to the likelihood of getting a disease. So risk factors on their own aren't a cause of a disease. They just represent an increased risk or an increased chance, but they're not a certainty. And similarly, having no or little known exposure to these risk factors does not mean that the person's not going to develop the disease. So some non-modifiable risk factors are things that we cannot change. And these include things like our gender. So women actually represent over 60% of all dementia diagnosis. Um, we can't control our age either. So the risk of developing dementia doubles every five years after the age of 65. And we also can't control our genetics. So certain gene variations, as well as family history of conditions uh, like kidney disease and Parkinson's also increase our risk. However, there are several modifiable risk factors, and these are things that are within our control. And these these things include uh, high cholesterol levels in our blood, high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking, and obesity, as these are major modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease, including heart disease and stroke. So the risk factors for cardiovascular disease represent risk factors for both Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. And these cardiovascular risk factors are more common as we age. And an easy way to remember all these things is by thinking that what's good for your heart is also good for your brain. Also wanted to mention that hearing loss can significantly increase one's risk of developing dementia. So our brain is like a muscle. If we don't use it, we're gonna lose it. And often people with hearing impairment can become socially isolated and therefore their brains aren't challenged enough um, since they're not hearing what's going on around them. 
And also important to note that traumatic brain injuries also increase a person's risk of developing dementia. So, um, you know, over the last few years, it's been lots of documentation about repeat concussions, especially in pro athletes and, and the devastating impact that can have on their brain as they age. Um, but we're going to talk about helping protect your head in a couple minutes. So it's important to remember that dementia is not a normal part of aging. And while most of us will notice some changes as we age, the more serious concerns related to dementia do not happen for everyone and cannot be explained as a normal part of aging. So for example, it's not a normal part of aging to forget details of a, con sorry, it's a normal part of aging to forget details of a conversation that happened a year ago. However, forgetting things that happened more recently, like a conversation you had yesterday or last week or an event you went to a couple of days ago, when you start to forget those, that's more cause for concern. Um, or when you forget where you put your keys, that's common uh, and not necessarily linked to dementia, but with dementia, you may forget what your keys are used for. And with normal aging, uh, you may forget an acquaintance's name, but with advanced dementia, you may forget the people that are close to you. And with normal aging, you may be worried about your memory because you're noticing these changes. But a more serious concern is when your relatives or those people that are close to you start to notice those changes in your memory that you may not notice yourself. So it's never too soon or too late to start making some changes that will maintain or improve your brain health. And these changes can also help reduce your risk of dementia or developing dementia. And as I mentioned earlier, you can reduce your risk of dementia by up to 40% if you focus on your brain health. So here's just a quick video to highlight some of the ways that you can reduce your risk. In the time it takes to watch this, you probably could run a quick errand or even fill your gas tank, but staying put will mean an investment in your brain health. Did you know that you can lower your risk of Alzheimer's disease by almost 40%? Start today by giving your body and brain a boost. Here's how in four easy steps. Step one, move. You already know that keeping your heart healthy is good for you. And what's good for your heart is good for your brain. Aim for at least 150 minutes a week, at least 10 minutes at a time of physical activity. Something that makes you breathe harder and sweat a little. A body in motion means a mind in motion. Step two, challenge your brain. Keep your brain sharp. Throw a curve in a typical day by simply taking a different route to the store or by learning a new skill. Step three, eat right. A healthy diet helps your brain function at its best and slows down memory loss. Step four, get social. Talk to your friends, volunteer, take a trip, find a new hobby. Make lifestyle choices that will keep you connected and get Oops. you thinking. There you have it. Commit at least 10 minutes to yourself today. You and your brain health are worth it. You can do something about dementia. All right, so we're gonna go over some of those um, suggestions that they provided in the video. Uh, but before we get there, like I mentioned, it's important to protect our head. Um, head injuries and head trauma can lead to dementia later on in life. Um, and these things include concussions. Um, and these are big risk factors for developing dementia. If we can protect our heads now, then we can help prevent problems in the future. So when you're in the car, making sure you wear your seatbelt, or if you're biking or rollerblading or skateboarding, make sure that you wear your helmet. That's your best line of defense. Another great way to reduce your risk is to challenge yourself. So keep your brain active every day. Stay curious, attentive, and aware. Uh, play games or crosswords, word searches. That new game Wordle is quite the hit. Um, pursue a new interest or learn something new, like learning a new language or finding a new hobby. And you want to make sure that you're going to concentrate your full attention on what you're doing in the present and be attentive and aware of what's taking place in each moment. This is going to engage your brain really well. 
And another important uh, selection criteria is to do something that's meaningful to you. People who have purpose in their lives are two and a half times more likely or less likely to develop dementia. And there are lots of great apps or websites for your electronic devices that can uh, help you stimulate your brain, which we're gonna talk about shortly as well. All right, time for a quick brain teaser. Uh, if you have a guess, I'd love you to drop it down into the chat. So Luke had it before, Paul had it behind, Matthew never had it at all, boys don't have it, all girls have it once, old Mr. Mulligan had it twice in succession, and Dr. Lowell had it before and behind, he had it twice as bad behind as before. Any guesses of what that is? And if you have any guesses, feel free to put it in the chat. Great, so the answer is L. So again, just something quick and easy to challenge your brain. So there is no magic activity, it's daily life. Involve yourself in activities that you're not already an expert at, uh, that are challenging for you and that you enjoy. And that is a quote by Dr. Nicole Anderson from Baycrest. Um, again, think about learning a new language. That's one of the best ways to stimulate our brain. Um, trying a new hobby or even something as simple as using your non-dominant hand to do some things like brush your teeth, that can really challenge your brain as well. Uh, we want to be socially active. So social isolation increases the risk of dementia. So it's important to stay socially active. Enjoy those events with your family and friends. Spend time with people. Um, join a book club or a hobby group. Um, take a class or just surround yourself with others. Staying connected socially helps you stay connected mentally as well. So research, research shows that people who regularly interact with others maintain their brain function better than those who don't. So socializing appears to have a protective effect on our brain uh, that may help lessen your risk of de developing dementia. Staying active and involved with life sends healthy messages to your brain and your body. So being involved with others helps to reduce your stress and boost your mood and helps keep those relationships strong. So accept those invitations to events. I know COVID is kind of made everybody uh, withdraw a little bit from being social, um, but there's ways that you can practice being social safely. Um, so again, accept those invitations and participate in clubs, whether it be virtual or in person, it's still an element of socialization. Uh, even consider volunteering. We accept lots of volunteers at the Alzheimer's Society. It's a great way to be active uh, and socially active as well, or find a new hobby. Uh, and you can even think about combining your social interaction with your physical activity. So by joining an exercise group or a walking group and really look to make the most out of your daily opportunities. All right. So remember what I said before that what's good for your heart is also good for your brain. So a healthy diet is good for your brain health. In general, uh, dark skin fruits and vegetables have the highest level of naturally occurring antioxidants. Um, and these vegetables include things like kale and spinach, Brussels sprouts, alfalfa sprouts, broccoli, beets, uh, red bell peppers are good, onions, uh, corn and eggplant. And fruits with high anti antioxidant levels include prunes and raisins, um, blueberries, blackberries, strawberries, raspberries, plums, oranges, red grapes, cherries, pretty much any of those, you're, you're starting off right. Um, cold water fish also contain beneficial omega-3 fatty acids. So that's fish like halibut, mackerel, salmon, trout, and tuna. Uh, some nuts can also be a useful part of your diet. Um, consider adding almonds or pecans or walnuts as they're a good source of vitamin E and, and antioxidants. 
And some other suggestions from the new Canada Food Guide. As a goal, you should eat a fruit and a vegetable or a fruit or a vegetable every meal and include these as your snacks. So at least a once a day, you should be having a dark green and one orange vegetable. Uh, and complex carbohydrates are things like quinoa and legumes. But unfortunately, if you're like me, I do love white bread, but white bread is not a complex carbohydrate. Uh, and we should really start to think of white bread as a treat or a dessert. And I have recently made the switch to whole wheat bread. So um, it's thinking about how to make those little changes to improve our diet, which is ultimately gonna help our brain health. So physical activity helps to maintain cardiovascular health and re reduce our risk of heart attack, stroke, and diabetes. Um, we saw in the video that the goal is about 150 minutes per week, which can seem a bit daunting, um, but break it into smaller increments. So do 30 minutes, five days a week. And whatever activity you choose to get your heart rate up, uh, you should definitely consider consulting a physician, especially if you have underlying health conditions. Even going for a short walk each day to capture those 30 minutes, um, that can increase your physical activity. But there's also other simple ways that we can increase our activity. Um, consider parking farther away from the entrance of a store or taking the stairs instead of an escalator or the elevator. Reducing our stress is another way to reduce our risk of dementia. Uh, and increased stress leads to increased blood pressure, uh, which then increases our risk of dementia. So prolonged stress increases the release of cortisol by the, adrenaline, by the adrenal glands. And prolonged high levels of cortisol are associated with more rapid aging of cognitive functions. As well, depression lowers concentration and left untreated depression can increase your risk of dementia. So developing coping strategies for stress are important. Um, consider practicing relaxation by using meditation or even seeking uh, a counselor if needed. We wanna make sure that we choose our habits wisely. Uh, avoid smoke, avoiding smoking and drinking can help our brain health. Um, a lifetime of smoking is li linked to an increased risk of cognitive impairment and vascular dementia. And a lifetime of high alcohol use is linked to various forms of dementia, including Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, additionally, for women, more than one drink a day, uh, and for men, more than two drinks a day also increases our risk of stroke, which therefore increases our risk of dementia. So we've looked at the risk factors and ways that we can reduce these risk factors. Now we're gonna look at ways that we can help our memory. Relaxation, uh, rehearsal and envisioning here. So relaxation will facilitate attention, which is crucial for your memory. Relaxation techniques help to maximize the receptiveness of your senses, which helps with encoding and retrieval of information. Attention maximizes the receptiveness of your senses by opening the door of your working memory to allow the data in. So you wanna limit your distractions and use all of your senses. Uh, rehearsal, uh, an example of that is writing things down. Uh, and rehearsal maintains data within conscious awareness. So it helps tr uh, transfer data from working memory into long-term memory. And envisioning helps with deeper storage of information, and it helps to create an anchor uh, to enhance our recall. So an example of this may be forming a mental picture of the grocery items that you need at the store. We also wanna make sure that we get a good night's sleep. Lack of sleep can often present similar, similarly to dementia. Uh, and we also wanna make sure that we're giving our brain enough time to, to relax. There are many causes for memory loss or cognitive decline, uh, many of which can be ruled out by your doctor. And this includes medication side effects or interactions between drugs, uh, clinical depression, or medical or neurological conditions. So again, if you're noticing any changes with your memory, you should speak with your physician 
so that uh, they can figure out what's going on and rule out some of those other potential causes. So some external ways to assist our memory include placing commonly uh, used items in a designated spot, such as your car keys, um, or writing things down. Some people find it helpful to use a calendar and write important things down there, uh, or keeping a journal even. And then using memory aids, such as a pill sorter, the ones that break it down to days of the week so that you can make sure that you're taking your pills on the correct day, uh, or using a timer when you're cooking. If you have any strategies that you use, I'd love to hear about them. So feel free to drop those down into the chat and we can share those with everyone. And while you're doing that, we'll continue on. Um, so looking at internal methods to assisting our memory, these things include uh, saying words out loud or saying names out loud or using uh, mnemonics which is a tool that helps us remember certain facts uh, or large amounts of information. And they can come from a song, a rhyme, an acronym, um, an image, a phrase, or even a sentence. Some people like to write little jingles as a way to remember some things. So like I mentioned, there are uh, countless examples of apps or websites that you can use uh, to engage uh, in some brain activity. Uh, even if you just Google brain games, there is no shortage of options or information available. Um, but these are just some that I have come across or have known clients to use in the past. Uh, if there's any that you use, again, feel free to drop those into the chat to share with the group. I'm sure that will be greatly appreciated by all. So a few little fun activities before we wrap up and take some questions. So what's wrong with this picture? Feel free to drop your answer into the chat box. Yeah, great. So some great answers. Anyone else have a guess? Great. Yeah, so some people are saying the eight is upside down. I will be honest. I did not notice that until recently and I've been using this example for some time. <laughs> um, but the other one is that the word the appears twice in the question. Can you spot the the mistake? Uh, and that's really just to show how quickly our brain can just interpret information or omit parts that aren't relevant anymore. And another one here. So I want you to um, say the word of each color and not read the word itself. So go through those words saying the word, saying the color of the word, not the word. And when you're done, just type in the chat box that you're done. Did you have trouble with it? Was it easy? Um, Great, so I see some comments. It was challenging, it was tricky. Some people said they didn't have an issue, which kudos to you. Um, I have to stop and really, really think, um, but it's definitely a conscious effort. Because again, your brain, like the last person just said, your brain starts to take over and tells you what it should be, right? Um, well, someone said that it was easy till they got to the last word and they read the word instead of the color. So simple little uh, tasks or games that we can, you know, make our brain go through to really challenge it. Um, if you do one of these a day, it's better than doing nothing, right? 
So how can we help? Well, if you're concerned about your own brain health or that of a loved one, um, you should see your doctor as soon as possible, like I mentioned, as the earlier the diagnosis, the better. But additionally, the Alzheimer's Society is a great source of information and support. And we have lots of great programs and services. Uh, we can provide education on a variety of topics or cater it specifically to your needs, whether that be in a group session or one-to-one. Um, there's also support groups, which are facilitated one-to-one -one or in a group counseling setting. We do have a young onset adult day program and other recreation programs for people living with dementia. Uh, our services are available in French and we do offer a respite program. Uh, we also have a memory clinic in Oshawa, Bowmanville and Scarborough. Those are um, dependent on a doctor's referral, but again, the sooner you can get into a memory clinic, um, the better off it's going to be uh, for that diagnosis and that treatment plan. And our annual walk for Alzheimer's is coming up on May 28th, so in about a month. If you're interested in putting in a team, you can check out our website on how to do that. The Alzheimer's Society is a nonprofit organization, uh, so all donations help us continue to allow um, to provide programs and supports to those people in need, as most of our services are free of cost to clients. And that is it. I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has. Um, yeah, we'll open the floor up. Thank you, Ashley, so much for such an informative presentation. I'm just going to stop the recording and then we can open it up for questions.